you probably know our speaker quite well because I know you've read her award-winning columns and books and there's something wonderful about Rochelle Riley's style of writing. You really feel that you know her well and um, that's an amazing attribute. So, but thank you so much. But I, I will read this because there's a lot more you guys don't know about her. Putting on my glasses. So, you know she is a writer by trade, warrior by necessity, spent nearly 20 years as a nationally syndicated columnist at the Detroit Free Press, where she was a fierce advocate for children, women, and accountable government. She left the newsroom in 2019 after having been inducted into the Michigan, North Carolina, and National Associations of Black Journalists Hall of Fame to become the city of Detroit's Director of Arts and Culture. And yay, Detroit. I think that's a wonderful thing to have. Her first major project was the United States' first citywide memorial to victims of COVID-19. Fifteen funeral processions circled the city's Belle Isle past 924 photo billboards of victims. And I know you probably remember seeing that. Uh-oh. People want you to speak closer. Closer. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to ruin my lipstick. Um, and so millions, 25,000 cars drove past the photos of the victims, and millions viewed the procession online and on television. In 2022, her office launched the Detroit Mural Map, where the city is documenting every mural painted on the walls and streets of the city, and they look outstanding. Nearly 600 murals and artist biographies are on the site now. She also co-hosted the nation's first National Street Art Summit, which brought seven of the top 10 American cities creating murals to Detroit for a conversation about the growing mural movement. And if you've not been down Woodward or in the heart of the city, I'm, every time I'm there, I just see some that I said, oh, that's a new one, where did that come from? So it's, it's really fun, fun to see on a regular basis. Um, you probably do know that she's the author of two books, The Burden African Americans and the Enduring Impact of Slavery, and That They Lived, African Americans Who Changed the World. She is a trivia friend, fiend, I'm sorry, who sings show tunes on demand. So you can ask her about that later. <laughs> Um, she lives near the banks of the Detroit River, but is rare, rarely at home. She has visited 28 countries and 33 states and counting. But besides all of that, she is a member of the August Wilson Society as a board member, board member of the Charles Wright Museum, board member of the Parade Company, and you do know about those two books. So please join me in welcoming Rochelle Riley to celebrate Women's History Month. Thank you. Hello, how, how is everyone doing? I'm going to be talking into two mics, but I'm also a former cheerleader, so you'll have no problem hearing me. Um, as she said, I am Rochelle Riley, writer by trade, warrior by necessity, and I did that in my column for almost 20 years. While I'm not writing the column all the time, uh, the editorial page editor, Nancy Kaffer, calls me up every now and again and says, please, anytime you want. So you may see something every now and again. I want to talk to you about a couple of things. First of all, there's never a better time to be a woman. And second, uh, how we're remaking an American city with beauty and art, and I'm so thrilled. Oh, that's even better. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be one of the women who is helping to do that. But I want to talk to you first a little bit about my career, because you all sort of know me from the Detroit Free Press years. But I want to start when I was a, uh, an editor at the Louisville Courier-Journal, Louisville, Kentucky. 
loved the Derby, loved living in Louisville, and I was the first African-American woman to be in a leadership role there. There's a lot of firsts in my life. But I was traveling back and forth to Virginia because that newspaper was owned by Gannett, a huge company that's gobbled up a lot of papers, and people like them or hate them, but they're still around. And one night, um, I wasn't able to call my daughter, as I would do every night to sing her Moon River so she'd go to bed. I told her nanny, I have to talk to her early tonight because we have a night meeting that's going to go on till 11 o'clock. And she said, okay, but before you talk to her, I have to tell you something. And I said, what, has something happened? Do I need to get on a plane? She said, no, 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 it's nothing like that. I just wanted you to know that I decided to surprise her. And uh, for dinner, I made a burger and fries. And she looked at it and she said, I didn't know you could get this at home. <laughs> the next day, I flew back to Louisville and I told the publisher that I was going to quit that I had missed the world's largest Sunday, I hadn't made all the parent-teacher conferences, and my daughter didn't know you could make your own hamburger. <laughs> he said, I can't let you quit. What can you do? And I said, come up with something. He said, what would you like to do? And it's nothing but God and women's intuition that I said, I'd like to write a column. I'd never written a column. I knew how to say things. I knew how to convince people to do things from the time I was in high school, but I I literally said that, and the next day he came up with a job description that was associate editor and columnist at the Courier-Journal. It was the first time it ever existed. It was the most amazing time of my life, and my very first column was to chastise the entire city for there not being anything to honor Muhammad Ali, who was its most famous citizen and one of the world's most famous citizens. And the mayor, Jerry Abramson, happened to be at the uh, convention uh, the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, and he called me up and he said, okay, we're embarrassed, you're right, we need to do it. And uh, the interesting thing about the column was it was not only my first column, but my first column that was edited by a new editor, and he said, y you know, I'm reading the column and you have named all of these rich people in town. Do you know them? And I said, no, but I know they're rich. <laughs> And if this is going to happen, they need to help participate. So when Mayor Abramson called me the next day, he said, you're right, we're embarrassed, we're going to do it. And we did raise $80 million for the Muhammad Ali Center on the banks of the Ohio River. And it let me know something I had learned a while back, that first of all, it's always a great time to be a woman. Most of the great changes that have happened in our country and in our state and sometimes in our cities, are because there were women behind them or behind the men behind them. And it reminded me of a story that I shared uh, in a speech earlier. I got invited to Green Bay, Wisconsin to speak to the Women's Foundation, and I spoke on the power of one. And I want to share just this little bit with you. Uh, I want you to listen to a little bit of a letter from Nancy Brinker of Peoria, Illinois, whose sister was stricken with cancer. After my sister was released from MD Anderson, that's in Houston where my uncle also underwent cancer treatments, I tried to come home every other week for a visit. One particular Sunday afternoon on the way back to the airport, Susie spoke to me about doing something to help the sick women in the hospital. This practically tore my heart out because here she was, hardly able to manage a whisper and she was worrying about other people. I couldn't bear it. When my father pulled up to the curb, I quickly kissed them both goodbye and jumped out of the car. I was about inside when I heard a funny sound that sounded like my name. I stopped in my tracks and turned around, and there was Susie, standing up outside the car on wobbly news, knees, wig slightly askew. With her arms outstretched, she said gently, goodbye, Nanny, I love you. I hugged her so hard I was afraid she might crumble, and then I ran to catch my plane. I never saw my sister alive again. After nine operations, three courses of chemotherapy and radiation, she lost her three-year war. By the time I flew back to her side, it was too late. She was gone. The months after her funeral were the saddest in my life. I wanted to stay near my parents because I knew they needed me, but I had a son at home and it, who had been without any attention for a long time. It was time to get on with it, pick myself up, and start living again. I spent a lot of time thinking about Susie. There is no way to accurately describe the void her absence left in my life. I also spent a great deal of time questioning my faith. I often wonder, as many people do when they've lost a loved one, what really happens to a soul when a person dies. I was haunted by our last conversation and lay awake all night wondering what I could do to help other women with breast cancer. What could one person really do? 
Nancy, who was living in Dallas, did something. She founded an effort in her sister's name, the Susan G. Coleman Foundation. She did it in 1982 in honor of her sister who died at 33. The organization has since raised almost $2 billion for cancer research. The power of one and one woman. I have devoted my life to that same thing. So at this moment, I want to bring up someone who's with me today because I mentor uh, 21 young women and as of today, it's now 22 because I have one shadowing me who is a part of the mayor's newest program. It's called the Youth Affairs Division, YAD. And what they do is try to come up with programming and initiatives and things that will help young people in Detroit to find ways to improve their lives, to find ways to find their dreams, and hopefully find their way to public service. So Danielle, if you want to come up, I just want her, <laughs> I just want you to meet her and let her tell you a little bit about herself. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Knott. I, attain, I at, attend oh, excuse me, Wayne State University as a second year student majoring in dance and pre-physical therapy. I work with Life Leaders as a youth representative for the city of Detroit, <coughs> representing districts two and five, um, to come up with initiatives for the city of Detroit for youth to have different opportunities around the city um, that aren't always offered. Very good. <laughs> So I'll give you a sense of, of what's happening now. Danielle and I met um, at the Naked Green Man, uh, down to the Spirit of Detroit statue. <laughs> I, I, I always wonder, you know, the most uh, entertaining and relevant symbol of our city is a Naked Green Man that sits right in front of City Hall. But we met in front of there and we went to um, have breakfast where we talked about all the things she does. I was hoping she would tell you some of those because she does 95 things. Mm -hmm. She uh, is a dancer. She uh, is into yoga. She, why didn't you tell them these things? That would have been wonderful. There, there's, no, there, there's lots of, but, but on top of all of that, she's a great student who, when we had a few minutes, because I thought the speech was at noon instead of one, and we got to walk around this magnificent library and to sit for a minute, she was sitting there rearranging her schedule for the fall. <laughs> so she's constantly thinking ahead, and I'm so proud of her. And we just met today, but she said she'd never been to the ballet, so I told her, well, we're going, so you can see the ballet. So I want to finish telling you about how I tried my best to make a difference. This power of one sits with me, which is why I mentor young women, because I want all of them to know that no matter what it is that you think you can do, you can do it. People don't do things because they don't do them. But anything that women can do, they can do. Uh, three of my columns that are near and dear to my heart, I'll tell you the first one, it was when a governor that I won't bother to name, it's been a while, um, said they couldn't balance the budget without cutting education. So I got a group of women, accountants <laughs> and a stockbroker and a woman business owner and a couple of my friends and we went into a conference room at the Detroit Free Press and we sat down with the budget and balanced the budget. And then I run a wrote a front page column about it. So of course, you know, I didn't save education for all children in America, but by God, you're not going to say you can't balance the budget if there's somebody who can do it. And if it can be done, a woman can do it. The other one was when it was time for the Detroit City Council to be elected by district. They had been elected at large, all nine members, which means there was no accountability, nobody was responsible for a particular area of the city. I called one councilwoman and said, well, when somebody has a problem, what are they supposed to do? And she said, well, they can call nine people. And I said, that's not an answer. Why do you want somebody to have to call nine people instead of there being a person responsible for their neighborhood? So the wonderful Mildred Madison, who worked with the League of Women Voters Detroit, started that campaign to change it to council by district. So I got together with a graphic artist and we created a map that showed what the city could look like with councils by district. They were all equal, same level of education, same level of income, each one had a special landmark, and we printed that whole special section. And that next November they voted for council by district. I didn't do that by myself, but what women can do, women can do. And if it can be done, a woman can do it. So um, the third one was, well, there were actually four, because the third one, which was near and dear to my heart, was writing for almost a year about kids aging out of foster care without the proper attention to what happens to them afterwards. You can't treat kids like kids and then they turn 18 and you say, okay, bye. 
And so I did that, and the governor formed a task force on uh, aging out of foster care so they could change some programs, make sure they could get college funding, get a car in some instances so they could uh, get to and from a job. Uh, but the last one, which is the longest I've ever worked on anything, was on adult literacy. When I wrote a column about the difficulty that uh, some Detroiters had in reading, and part of that was, you know, just a fact of life because you didn't have to have a college degree to work on the line. You know, we're an auto, we're an auto state, we're an auto country, and a lot of people would work on the assembly line and be excellent workers but not be able to read. The functional illiteracy rate was high. So I wrote that and there were two reactions. Uh, some people called and said, don't tell people. And some people called and said, what can we do? And I spent 16 years writing about making sure that we were paying attention to functional literacy, raising money, bringing attention to it, writing columns about people who were learning to read for the first time. And my favorite was a young man named Derek Guilford, who owns his own construction company, lives in Macomb County. He went from not being able to read and dealing drugs to being an upstanding family member with his own company, all because he learned to read. I was so thrilled to write those stories and show people what could happen if you pay attention to a problem and try to solve it instead of just talking about it. So now that I've left the newsroom, and it is hard because every now and again something will happen and I will literally grab my computer and start to type and remember, oh wait, you don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, but occasionally I will do things on my social media accounts that are sometimes on fire. So for anybody who follows me, at Rochelle Riley on Twitter, which is still Twitter and will always be Twitter, <laughs> and uh, on Facebook and on threads and uh, on Instagram. Because sometimes you just have to say something. You, you just have to. Um, but I left the newsroom uh, in 2019 because I had lunch with the mayor and I said, I'm gonna leave the newsroom. It's time for my you know, second act. I have spent all these years as a journalist. I'm very proud of the career that I had. I've been three halls of fame. I have all these awards. I, I need to focus on a different type of public service. And I say a different type because media is a public service. And if we don't totally kill it, we will make sure that somebody's telling the truth about the things that are happening in our country. But I said, um, I know what I want to do. And he said, what? I said, I'm going to get a master's in this new program called theater management at Wayne State. And I want a theater. Find me a building. I'm going to create a theater because we don't have enough theaters anyway. You can never have enough theater. And yes, I do sing Broadway show tunes on demand. Um, and, and for Detroit to be the largest majority black city in America, we don't have a Detroit black repertory theater. And I'd been to black repertory theaters in several cities, and it was amazing how they're making sure to keep the works of amazing playwrights like Lorraine Hansberry and August Wilson alive. All the mayor heard was the word theater. He said, oh, you're into the arts, huh? I said, well, yeah, uh, I paint, I'm a photographer, I, you know, I write, as you know. And I made the mistake of saying, and I sing show tunes on demand. And he said, I need a director of arts and culture. And I said, well, what's the job? He said, we haven't had one for almost 20 years. And I said, well, that's just heinous. But I didn't say that just to him. I said it to myself. How did we not have that? And I might write a column decrying that so that we, I mean, I could not believe it. But because I was so focused on children and on government and on all the latest stuff that needed to be fit, it never, ever dawned on me that we didn't have a director of arts and culture. So I said, well, yeah, I'd be interested in that. So three days later, I got a call saying, welcome to the city of Detroit. So I was a party of one power of one with no budget and no staff, but um, we announced in February of 2020. Two weeks later, <laughs> we were in the throes of the beginning of the worst pandemic that America has seen ever. And I thought, well, this isn't good. The very first thing that we did was plan a telethon because I got calls from people every day saying, I'm a gig musician, I get paid in cash, I have to feed my family. Or I'm a dancer and I have no ability to go anywhere to dance. Or uh, my theater is shut down, I'm going to lose the building. I mean, it was just, I don't think anybody really paid attention to an entire industry that was uh, falling apart. So the very first thing we did was a telethon where we got Jeff Daniels and Morgan Fairchild, who will always be one of my favorite people, and Big Sean and uh, Hill Harbor, all these folks to, to come together with some local performers and put on a telethon for people to send in money so we could give these grants to people so they could feed their families, make their rent. 
And I thought, okay, so this is gonna be not um, this amazing plan that we announced in February, but survival mode. And I'm thinking, okay, what's the next thing we can do to help people? When this woman named Cher Comer called the mayor and said, we appreciate that you are trying to do things and you're making sure that we're gonna get the vaccine when it comes out. But my mother died in the hospital and they wouldn't let me see her. They, you know, when people were going in back in those days, as you recall, you couldn't go in the hospital to visit. You weren't there when they died. It happened with one of my friends whose wife could not be with him and the hospital director was a friend of his and he was with him when he died. And so um, the mayor was having a press conference with Tony Michaels, who's the head of the parade company, one of the most optimistic and effusive people you ever met. He is constantly smiling. And uh, he was explaining to people that the fireworks would not be live down on the river like they usually are, but they would be on television. But he said, they're gonna be great, they're gonna be so exciting, you're still gonna love them, everything's wonderful. And my colleague, my former colleague from the Free Press, M.L. Elric, came up to the mic and said, well, Mr. Mayor, I appreciate that you're talking about the parade and all of these other programs that are going on, but people are hurting. What are you going to do about the call for a memorial? Now, I'm at home watching the press conference, I wasn't there. And the mayor said, we are gonna have a memorial. It's gonna be bigger than the fireworks and Rochelle Riley is in charge of it. <laughs> so I have to tell you again, it, there's always, it's always a good time to be a woman. Alexis Wiley, who was his chief of staff, we started having meetings about what a memorial could look like. And in these meetings, every, every time it's like, okay, what are we gonna do first meeting? And I said, well, I have to come up with something because people can't gather, you know, they, they'd even want you. This wasn't about mass, this was about not leaving your house. This was about not going anywhere. So I said, well, they just announced that they weren't going to do uh, the dream cruise. You know, everything's being shut down. So we could do a cruise, like a memorial cruise. So the next meeting she said, well, why would people do that? Where are they gonna cruise to? And I said, I'll, be, I'll get back to you. And I said, well, I don't want the Dallas Poli I mean, the Detroit Police Department to have to shut down streets, so that's not gonna work. And I went, oh, wait a minute, we have an island. I said, well, we can cruise around Belle Isle. So the next meeting, she said, oh, that sounds great, but why would people do that? And I said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and I don't know what got me to this part, but I remember Cher Comer not being able to see her mom. And I said, what if we gave people one last look? and not the look that we choose, but something that was their great memory. So they would you know, give us their photograph, whether it was of their wedding or of a bar mitzvah or you know, a Christian, you know, anything, but they get to pick. She said, oh my God, that's great, I love that. How are you gonna keep them in their cars? I said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and I thought, funerals. Nobody will get out of the car if they're in a funeral procession. So I called every funeral home in Dallas, and if, I keep saying Dallas because I just got back from Dallas where my grandson is, I'll show you a picture. <laughs> so I called every funeral home in Detroit, and I called a few in Gross Point, and every single one of them said, we'll help, and we'll do it without pay, and we will do it for as long as you need. And we started with the beautiful white LaSalle that the Swanson's funeral home used for Aretha Franklin's funeral. And we did a staging area right outside the Aretha. And um, people signed up. They, they sent it, because with HIPAA, I couldn't ask you know, anybody for the names of people who died of COVID. We had to get that information from people. So we did a smart sheet that we sent out to all of these people. They filled them out and they sent in these pictures and they were high school graduations and weddings and first dates and just, you know, best dress, just, just amazing slices of life. And we had them all blown up to billboards and posted them all around Belle Isle, 924 of them. And the night before this big event, I was out there with <laughs> my friend Malia Howard, who works for special projects for the mayor, and Ray Solomon, who's the head of the neighborhoods department. And Ray, <laughs> I'm sorry, Malia, had a big sledgehammer where she was going through and knocking them in to make sure they were solid and even, every single one. And he was coming behind her to make sure that they were straight. And I was coming behind him to whack weeds because I didn't think they'd cut the grass low enough. <laughs> so people were driving around Belle Isle the night before this big memorial. Hey, Miss Riley, what you doing? Whacking weeds. <laughs> and we were out there for hours doing that. 
and it was such a labor of love, and it involved every department at the city. I have to thank every department head. I mean, our Department of Public Works, our water department, everybody sent volunteers. Imagine hundreds and hundreds of people, actually it was thousands of people, coming through to get in a funeral procession to go down uh, Jefferson to drive around and to come back out and it went off without a hitch. What the mayor said that day was, if you want to invade a small country, call Rochelle Riley. <laughs> but it was seen by uh, millions of people. We got emails from around the world, and it was featured as a part of President Bi Biden's inaugural coverage. And we kept it open because people still wanted to see it. That first day was just for the families and the people who signed up for the funeral processions. But that was a Monday. On Tuesday and Wednesday, we kept it open. And some people wanted it to be permanent. And I said, no, I don't think we need a permanent reminder. We have those. Plus, a big storm is coming Thursday. And sure enough, by late Wednesday night, this wind started to whip up, and a few of them started to go out uh, into the river. So we had to go and take them all up. But we gifted them uh, to the families. And the most moving picture that I got in the months after that memorial was somebody had put that billboard in their front bay window of their living room. So everybody who drove past saw that. And that was probably the first time I cried. So that's why it's so important to know your power as a woman. That's why it's so important, particularly in these times, as people are diminishing women, as people are thinking that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough. But you know what? You are smart, you are kind, and you are special. And there is a talent that you have that can help with whatever is going on, whether it's a campaign that somebody's running for office or whether it's an initiative that your city is doing, or whether it's selling baked goods at the school because it'll mean the difference in every kid getting a book. Just remember that whatever it is that can be done, women can do it. And I want to share a little bit about what this woman is doing now because uh, the mayor's neighborhood beautification project is one of the most important in the city because you all know what Detroit looked like. I got here in September of 2000. I was supposed to be here for two years. It'll be 24 years in September because Detroit gets a hold of you. This region is so amazing. I love this place dearly and I couldn't leave. And the greatest compliment I get from people is they think I'm a Detroit native. As a matter of fact, this guy calls me up about, well, he stopped now, once a month to say, we went to Cass Tech together. And I said, no, I, <laughs> I went to school in North Carolina. He said, no, I know we went to Cass Tech together. You just don't want to admit it. I said, well, that is a great compliment for me that you think I was here in high school. but. No, I, I was born in Tarboro, North Carolina. It was a little town of 10,000 people. There were 10,000 people there then. There are 10,000 people there now. And I only wanted to go to one college my whole life, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm a Tar Heel. And I only wanted to be a journalist. So I literally have lived my dreams. I grew up in a small town. I went to my favorite school, and I became a journalist. But when I got to be you know, sort of 30 years in, I said, OK, People sometimes think I'm too direct, you know, because I always say what I think, say what I feel. How many of you read my column when I was writing? Thank, oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've, I've always been that way. After high school, in high school, I was very shy. I didn't want to go to the prom. I didn't like talking in front of people. But my senior year, I mean, I busted out. I was in every club. I was the co-president of student government. I went back from my high school reunion after 10 years, and all these people were running up to me, and I said, God, you guys remember me? And they said, what are you talking about? You were the most popular girl in school. I said, I was? <laughs> I missed that whole thing because I was so busy trying to escape my small town and get to Carolina and go off and be a journalist. I sort of lost a whole moment of my life that I probably would have enjoyed more had I known that so many people liked me. And I was the homecoming queen. I, I accepted the uh, stole in a cheerleader outfit. So when I say I did everything, I did everything. Um, but one of the things that means so much to me is making sure that the young women that I meet know that whatever they want to do, they can do. Danielle is a dancer. And <laughs> when she walked up to me, I said, well, I can tell you're a dancer. I mean, oh my God, I clump around like this. And you are graceful. And, you know, and, and she said, yes, but it's a shame there's no dance companies in Detroit. So when I graduate, I'm probably going to have to leave. Well, by God, now i got to go back to City Hall and <laughs> make a dance company. Um, but, but that's the goal. I want to make sure that all of this talent, we have so much talent in this region. My daughter went to West Bloomfield High School, but I've been in almost every high school in Detroit, in Oakland County, 
maybe one in Macomb County and in Washtenaw County, because uh, I lived down the street from Pioneer when I was a fellow at the University of Michigan. I meet the most amazing young women. I mean, all of them could grow up to be president if we look at them that way. If we, if we see them and don't imagine them doing lesser jobs or not see them in some full potential that we wouldn't even think about. People used to say, literally, don't tell people they can be president. That's not true of everybody. And I said, yeah, but you don't know which one it's true of, which means you just keep saying it. But anyway, so in my job with the power of one for almost a year and a half, um, I started to look at things the way I wanted them to be. Because when I got here in September of 2000, this place was a mess. There weren't any stores on Woodward Avenue. My daughter and I had to go to Southfield to the movies, and we used to go to the movies every Friday night. There was no national chain grocery store. I was doing an interview on NPR and mentioned that to my friend Michelle Martin, and she still talks about it to this day. If I'm doing an interview, she'll do you all have a grocery store? Yes, we have a grocery store now. But, <laughs> but back then, we didn't. When you go into Detroit now and see what it looks like, we are the best sports town. We have more restaurants per capita than any city in America. They don't always stay open, but another one sprouts right up. <laughs> and, and it's just wonderful. And I want people to see that. I want people to understand that. That's why I so believe in the Mayor's Neighborhood Initiative. So remaking an American city with beauty and art is what I talked about last year at South by Southwest. I was so thrilled to be invited. I thought I'd be in a little room with some other arts directors talking about how we do our jobs. It was one of the opening sessions with 200 people. And all they wanted was to know if I could get my mayor to come and tell their mayor how we do stuff, which made me feel really good. So remaking American City, it's, it's, it's very easy because what we do is literally start where you are. So as I told you, we were born in a pandemic, pandemic. And the first thing we did, because we were one of the hardest hit cities, was to do that telethon. And then, of course, we did the memorial. So these were some sad times in that first year. Everything was about survival and making people pay attention to how art and music could make you feel better, could, could help you socially. But after three years of all of that sort of, okay, let's just start fixing things, affordable housing, opportunities for education, a whole lot of people just stopped working or lost their jobs. So we were trying to make sure we could do that. There are still people who won't go back to work, which is stunning to me. Restaurants can't open until four. And, you know, everybody is talking about their staffing shortages, and I'm just dying to know, what are these people doing? If I had my column, I'd be driving around asking, okay, who used to work here? Let me go to their house so I can, what are you, what are you doing now? I just, I just want to have a sense so I understand how this works. Um, but anyway, so uh, he did the Blight to Beauty campaign, and we became a leader in the national mural movement because we want color and grace everywhere. Detroit was a very gray city. It's still a very gray city. It won't be forever. So we launched the Detroit mural map. We are documenting every mural in the city. You can go to that map at DetroitArtsAndCulture.com and you can see every mural and a biography of the artist, why they did it, and you can do your own tour. We can't afford to take buses around all day every day, although I'd rather do that than the 13 other projects I'm doing right now. Well, that's not true. I love those projects. But but you can do self-guided tours where you can see. Now people don't call me up and say, I'm at the corner of Adams and James, and can you tell me whose mural this is? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> use the map. <laughs> um, and we're placing, uh, uh, you're now able to use an Android as well as an iPhone to do that. You can walk up to any mural and be able to identify it. And we put murals on everything in vacant windows, on buildings, the City Walls program, which was founded in 2017, and they were founded just to replace graffiti, you know, to paint over it. And they would paint over a wall, and of course, for some graffiti artist, artists, that was a fresh canvas, and they'd go back out and paint it again. So this wonderful artist named Sanders Bryant told that group, if you put a mural up there after you paint it, they won't tag a mural. They're not going to, and sure enough, if you put a mural up, the graffiti artist would not touch it. So that's how they started doing murals, and they've done about 200 of them now. And then we commissioned the city's first street mural, Power to, Power to the People. It's on Woodward. And uh, this was interesting because this happened because the uh, Civil Rights Division wanted a street mural. And they said, people are uh, painting Black Lives Matter. We want to do that on our street. I said, well, when we do work, the first thing we do is an open call for people to decide that instead of us deciding. So 
literally the next day, totally coincidentally, this children's group calls Detroit Heals Detroit, and they are teenagers who work to help each other heal from trauma, you know, whether somebody they know has been shot or a victim of violence. And they said, we'd like to paint a street. And I said, we got streets. So I got that group of kids to be the curators, and we did an open call for the city's first street mural. And they got 34 artists to turn in proposals. 32 of them were Black Lives Matter and some version of that. Dr. Hubert Massey sent in a proposal for Power to the People. And these kids said, we don't want what everybody else has on their streets. We never heard of Power to the People. We want that. I said. <laughs> Lord, you youngins, if you only knew how old that was. <laughs> so he won, and so we are the um, only city that had a mural that was not Black Lives Matter, and we try to repaint it every two years. But in addition to that, Dr. Massey, and he's encouraged me, and we want to do this with the Detroit Public Fund, to restore some of the murals that have been around for a while. We can't do all of them. I mean, there's almost 600 on the mural map now, but some of the most iconic ones that we want to make sure last, we want to go and restore them. So this is him restoring Dr. Charles McGee's mural on the side of the Foundation Hotel. So this is about, you know, color and getting people involved. If you've got a storefront, you know, paint it purple. Don't let it stay gray. Put color everywhere. And then the mayor decided to let me have $5.4 million. Now, I don't know why he did that, but uh, the COO did. He said, we want you to do some arts alleys. Just take some alleys and turn them. How many of you have been downtown to the, the, the alley by the Z garage? It's a beautiful space that literally you walk into it like it's, you know, a concrete park, but you can go in the back doors of galleries and restaurants, and it's a great entertainment space. And I said, well, I'll do it, but I'm only going to do it in the neighborhoods. We don't need anything else downtown. There are people to do that. Dan Gilbert's doing that. We, we want to do this in the neighborhoods. So this one is one of the few commercial ones because uh, John and Alicia George have been hosting events in the alley behind the artist market for 30 years. So what we do is we go and take the torn up concrete and we pave nice new concrete and we decorate and they have this space that's great. Uh, we'll fix the infrastructure under the concrete, and then you have a really great space to have events. This one is a neighborhood mural that's behind the houses, where you can paint murals on the garages. People can, you know, walk up and down. They can host events, picnics, little chamber music if they want to, or just a safe place for the kids to play. In addition to that, uh, my friend Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Jefferson, one of the most amazing soldiers in the world, um, he died uh, right after his 100th birthday, and he was a part of the Tuskegee Airmen, and they flew more successful missions escorting bombers than anybody else. The bombers always requested them because they knew they'd get back alive. We've done a plaza, and the statue is almost finished of him that we're going to erect on Rouge Park. And we did it at Rouge Park because that's where he flew uh, model airplanes as a boy. And then we also do things for young artists, young, gifted, and woke. We, and this is something that Danielle's group is doing. I said, you all decide what you want it to be and I'll write the check. I don't know what they're doing yet, but I'm still going to pay for it. But one of the most important things we did last year was to pair musicians with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra with uh, po young poets from Inside Out Arts. And we put them on stage at Orchestra Hall so that they could perform their poetry while the um, musician played. And we turned it into a program that ran on Channel 4. And I'll send it to your leadership so you can see it if you like. And then we did one other thing to celebrate all of these folks who, while they did not have a director of arts and culture, you know, we need to make sure they know that the city now recognizes all they've done. So we give ACE honors, like the Kennedy Center honors, to anybody who's done 25 years or more. We're going to do that again in May. So to recap, we've come a long way since we were, you know, born in chaos. The art alleys will be completed this year. And ACE will continue collaborations with Dr. Hubert Massey. This is a little piece of the wall he's done next to the Chrysler uh, Company downtown. It is the largest mural in the state, one of the largest in the country. It's 1,500 square feet that tells the story of the great migration of folks coming from the south up to the north to work. And last September, we had a National Street Art Summit where seven of the 10 best mural cities came to Detroit. And Detroit is on that list. And I'll tell you why. In Detroit, we use our streets, we use our walls, we use our city for art.
It gives insight into a city's culture and personality. It turns brick into canvas and mortar into museums. Only four cities in America do murals better than we do. Now we're number five, but we're aiming for number one. In Detroit, soon you'll be able to use your smartphone in front of any mural and meet the artist who did it. Or you can see the murals without leaving home. Our mural map will show you where all the murals are and let you plan a tour of your favorites. Visit DetroitArtsAndCulture.com. See why Detroit is a leader in street art. And yes, we're that good. Thank you very much.